Hello entrepreneurs, welcome back to another course video. I'm Mariela Tritenko and let's begin in our lecture discussion today on the first box of the business model canvas, value propositions. In the simplest definition, the value proposition is a statement that expresses the worth, the value of something which most likely is your idea or product to a customer segment. Now, value propositions are the first box of the canvas, but in my opinion, it's probably one of the hardest boxes to nail. It's hard to distill your entire product or technology into a single statement to tell a certain customer why you're different and worthwhile. Even many fully developed companies don't know how to articulate their own value proposition, which makes it hard for employees, suppliers, partners, or anyone involved in the customer ecosystem of that company to understand what they're doing. And so the customer doesn't ensure that they get the right experience for their value. Hence why the value proposition is an important place to start. Heck, even some founders don't see eye to eye when they come to the value proposition. However, if you don't have a value or can't express what the main benefit is, then you really don't have a place in the market. So this is why we start off with this as the first box of the business model canvas. Now, going back to Steve Blank, we're going to do a deep dive in this discussion about how your value proposition statement is not about your idea or about your product. It's not a list of the features of what your product can do, but rather what you can do to benefit your customers by solving a problem or a need that they have. Truly think about what are the benefits of the features of your idea or technology and for who? Most founders really forget who they're building this startup for and always think of the benefit that the customer receives. Founders have to remember that your value proposition works hand in hand with your customer. And that's why for your first dog quiz, think of this question. What is the relationship noted in the blue between value propositions and customer segments called? Take a moment to think about this answer. Got it? Well, the answer is product market fit. And it's because value propositions really cannot exist on their own. They must exist in relation to a customer. So much that we give it a special name called product market fit, the relationship between value propositions and customer segments. As you embark on your entrepreneurial journey, you'll probably hear this term a lot. Can you guess why? Well, it's because product market fit is what will make your startup succeed or fail. If you don't have product market fit, then you most likely don't really have a good business. Being able to articulate the value you provide to your customer demonstrates that you as a founder know what you're building is really needed or wanted by the customer on the other end. So start by making some guesses and some initial value proposition hypothesis that you can go out and test during customer discovery. Now that we have some groundwork, we can really begin with part one on this lecture discussion video series on value propositions. In this video, we're going to begin by defining the problem. Even with a great idea, there's a whole bunch of thinking you can do before executing the solution. Most founders miss this critical step of problem understanding, thinking of problems that are unworkable, unavoidable, urgent or undersolved problems that your customers are right now experiencing. In the next video after this, we'll go into what Steve Blank describes as pain killers and gain creators, where we'll really evaluate a bit more on the problem. And in the third part video series of here, you will go into a deep dive of building the value proposition statement and a bit on the minimum viable product. Because remember, your idea or technology is just a small one critical piece necessary to build a company. And it's just a part of the value proposition. So let's begin with understanding the problem. When we as customers buy a product, we're essentially hiring it to get a job done. And if that product does the job well, well, when we're confronted with the same job, we'll hire that product again. And if the product does a bad job, well, we know what happens, you gotta fire it. And 
find another solution to hire to fix that problem. When we say jobs to be done, we don't mean a nine to five or whatever schedule the business may have for an employee. Here, we're thinking of a job that is a higher purpose that we as customers buy the specific solution for. It's the higher purpose for why we buy products and identify what jobs what we need done. Hence this theory. People buy products for different reasons. The job the customer wants is a good way of thinking why people buy pro products, what the problem is that they're really facing here. So when you go out and interview people for customer discovery, you want to make some guesses and craft hypothesis around why your customers are buying certain products. So take, for instance, this explanation, this quote below that we have by an economist, Theodore Levitt, and think if you know the ending to this quote. People don't want to buy a quarter inch drill. What do they actually want? They actually want a quarter inch hole. Do you think people actually need some of these big drill bits to create holes? I mean, it'll allow you to create numerous quarter inch holes very efficiently and very fast, but we don't need this drill bit on a daily basis, or at least I don't living in New York City to hang one painting. No, there's other ways to get the job done of creating a hole than just this quarter inch drill. Think about it. You can use a hammer and a nail to get the same hole done. You can even use a manual auger bit. Uh, you can think of even pouring acid or getting some termites. Might not be the most efficient job, but it gets a solution, but it gets the job done. Think of the real reason someone, a specific customer, is motivated to spend their money and buy a product or service. Remember, the end result is the solution to your client's problems. This is what makes their life better. This is what they're paying for. And this quote ultimately is brilliant because it illustrates in the simplest of terms why you need to sell results and not just the product features. Obviously, there's many uses for a drill outside of just creating the hole. Hypothesize what a customer segment can get out of it. Maybe a construction worker is looking to create higher, bigger, numerous building spaces and thus can do this with creating numerous holes to put their parts in. Or fathers in suburban environments may be looking to build a patio deck and consider this as a safer solution. But the ability to create a building or construct a deck doesn't go far enough in the jobs to be done theory. You build a building to generate a living space, to generate office space, to create communal structures. You build a patio deck to have a place to relax, to throw a party, to hang out with your family members. That is what you're paying for truly. So let's take another example here and try to articulate if we really know what the jobs to be done theory is. Finish this sentence. Nurses don't necessarily want a thermometer. What do they want? Well, nurses want to know if patients have a change in body temperature. There's other ways to get a temperature reading than just using a thermometer. Think about the back of your hand or a strip thermometer. There's even urinary catheters that take the temperature reading quite accurately as well to get a reading. Success comes from making the job rather than the product or the customers. This is a job to be done is solution agnostic. So founders should understand what the customer hopes to accomplish. What is their job to be done? So let's continue this and break down jobs because they're very complex and multifaceted. You know, jobs require definition and precise detail, but they can be broken down into these three functions, functional jobs, emotional jobs, and social jobs. Functional jobs are the core tasks that your customer wants to get done. It's often something that this customer may be accomplishing for, have been trying to accomplish for years, for decades perhaps. A functional job is usually stable over time. And what changes are the product and services that companies offer. The core function of a thermometer reading uh, to get a temperature check has not changed much over centuries. But regardless of the solution capabilities of a strip thermometer or a contactless thermometer, the function still remains. 
there are also emotional and social jobs, how your customers want to feel or avoid feeling as a result of the functional job. Sometimes these blend together, but they are distinct. As a customer uses the product, they may want to feel a certain way or be perceived in a certain light. Using a fancy contactless thermometer, or an in-ear thermometer that measures the temperature may make a nurse feel more emotionally connected to her patients. Thus, the emotional job there is wanting to feel like they're contributing to the advancement of society or she or he has a social connection and wants to be perceived by their colleagues as good peers. Understanding the emotional and social components of a functional job really brings you rich insights that could lead to the creation of your value proposition that resonates with customers. So let's keep pushing on the thermometer example. I've broken this out for you into three different benefits to think about. On the same example, we're gonna stick with a nurse at a large public hospital who uses a contactless thermometer in her daily job function to help keep my patients healthy. So we can simply begin by breaking it out into functional benefits, emotional benefits, social benefits as listed in the blue bubbles on the screen. Can you think of some example hypothesis to push forward? What is the value of each of these components? So take a moment, pause the video, think of some example hypotheses here as well. If not, keep the video recording going and we'll go deep into these examples for you now. So let's take the functional benefit. Makes me efficient at my work. Well, you can break this down in thinking of the function of the speed. This can help this public hospital nurse get the temperature reading maybe six times faster than the current solution. That's a real value that's very specific and testable. You know you have a quantitative metric to understand. Maybe she needs the solution to be 10 times faster in order to adopt a new solution. This gives you some baseline to think about how much speed would the function need to be here. Think even faster with power. It might give her the ability to see 10 more patients in a daily shift. And that's a lot more function to be able to do with this kind of technology. Let's take it a step further into an emotional value to provide. Well, maybe the versatility, maybe the ability to work in different environments, thus allowing flexibility of moving patients to different hospital locations. Now, medical care has changed into different settings. And so versatility and being able to adapt to different situations has, seen, has been seen as a large value to some. Reliability, maybe this gives her the emotional confidence necessary that she can think on knowing she can count on her equipment. And maybe here we can push it a step further and think, well, it's 100% accurate. We don't know, maybe uh, there's other technical insights that need to be run there, but thinking of quantitatively what will move the needle for your customer is very important as you build out your value propositions. And lastly, again, for some sample example hypotheses to lead for a customer discovery discussion to learn about this nurse's problem. Let's look at the social benefit here, which is the ability to convey her professional status. Again, we're pushing here on an archetype that we really haven't seen before. Maybe she needs to demonstrate that she's educated and that she is quick to adapt on new innovation needs during critical times of changing situations. Maybe she's looking to inch towards a promotion and by using some sort of high tech innovation, it shows to her boss, to her leadership that she is focusing on quality. So can you see the customer archetype evolving? We really went deep into this one job on one problem that she may be facing on helping keep her patients healthy. Now, from all of these jobs, you can make some really good hypotheses on why your customer will care. We really understood functionally, emotionally, and socially some of these things. And we can form an interview script of questions based on these. 
So thinking of just the nurse alone here is one way to think of the problems your customers are facing. But don't forget, each customer will value different products differently. What are the other jobs to be done by other customers in the ecosystem? What about the doctor in that hospital as well that works above the nurse or the medical billing specialist? Why do they care about the technology? So focus in on one customer segment, but realize the other archetypes involved in the adoption process. So we're going to wrap up part one here by going into the law of QRST. For each customer segment, you want to form testable value proposition hypothesis. The word hypothesis can really just be defined as an educated guess. For a hypothesis to be testable, it means that it's possible for us to make observations that we can agree or not agree with. Science is about observing the process and making inferences from observations and going out to run some tests. So as you go out to do customer discovery, make your hypotheses quantitative or quantifiable. Can you measure the value? We were thinking about increasing number of patients or being able to think of the accuracy. Use numbers and don't be afraid to make some guesses. Make sure that they're relevant. Can you reasonably do this? Think, dream big of the problems that there are, but can you reasonably and possibly do what you say? Don't forget to get down to specifics, drill to the detail, exactly what value is the customer receiving? And lastly, testable. A scientific hypothesis must be testable. A scientific hypothesis must also then be falsifiable. So now that we've thought about some of the problems and how solutions can be crafted into benefits and thinking of what your customer may be facing, let's move on to the second part of this video lecture discussion series in evaluating the pain relievers and game creators that your value proposition may address. And so you may have seen this, this diagram in Steve Blank's videos. This is the value proposition canvas. It's a tool to lay out three components driving the MVP. And those are first, the products and services. Thinking of what exactly your tech or product is, is quite easy. You write a list of sufficient features to solve a customer problem for a known group. And this is generally easy to conceptualize what you do. The second and third, game creators and pain relievers, are a bit tougher, but your customer is looking for one of these two things. You can make a list of features all you want, but at the end of the day, the customer doesn't care about this long list. Customers don't care for features. They care about what those features do for them. And one of those reasons that for interviewing people is to engage in a dialogue that lets you be sure and understand the problem you're solving and measuring your customers' reactions. So we're going to begin with thinking of pain relievers. Uh, this is again, just from Steve Blank. This is to think about a discussion on your startup needs. So pain relievers are statements that are the negative and annoying states that the features remove. How exactly is your product or service feature list going to alleviate a specific customer pain or problem? How can you explicitly outline how you intend to reduce or eliminate specific pains through the use of your product or service? In essence, this is a chronic pain that your customer goes through on a daily basis. No other problem product has been able to alleviate this problem to the same degree. This pain could take the form of emotional stress, higher costs, increased risk. Think about your industry domain. A need might not kill you at first, but it will if you don't address it. And you really need to know these things. So going back to the video, think of some hypothesis statements your startup can address through the value proposition. Are you producing savings that are a current burden? Are you making your customers feel better from current solutions that can do their job more efficiently? Maybe underperforming solutions that really don't get the job done. Can you end consistent difficulties, things that are daily problems that people are facing? Maybe thinking on a higher level that there are social consequences intended. Sometimes environmental startups can take this form. And maybe thinking on the eliminating 
risks in a process. Risks are a very big thing to think about, alleviating the stress, the chances of error, or barriers that the customer faces. So we can go deeper in these, but you've already probably seen these before. Think quantitatively, specifically, and make testable guesses. You want to also rank your pain reliever hypotheses in your value propositions by intensity and frequency. With these, you can really know the impact your customer is facing. Have you heard this statement numerous times or one time? Is this a life-saving pain or just a once in a while? So look back at this slide to really frame some of your value proposition guesses. Now, game creators are simply not the inverse of pain relievers. Uh, this is one people really don't think about. Games that are not simply the opposite of pain. These are the hidden ambitions people have in their life, things that make them happy, the improved and positive states that come from the features you deliver. Creators are the positive and improved states of being that come from those features. Generally speaking, everyone has a gain from a good product. Game creators describe exactly how products and services provide incremental value and customer gains. They outline how your product and service can go above and beyond just the expense of that purchase. Thinking on some examples on how you may fulfill a need on some other startups, think of Facebook. They took our need for friendship and attempted to recreate that online. Twitter also allowed us to share and communicate in real time. Thinking of the need also higher levels that there are can really create some good value propositions that your customers are looking at solutions. So what excites your customer? Think of these questions for your startup and how you are creating gain. How are you creating positive consequences that the customer desires? How are you creating savings that make your customer happy? Savings don't have to be monetary. Think of the metrics that are needed to adopt a new solution. And how can you product, produce expected or better than expected outcomes? Just like Pain create painkillers, you need to rank these by relevant and frequency. How often in your customer discovery interviews are these things happening? And getting the feedback from customers that you need will give you that significance of this game. So here are some more hypotheses from Steve Blank that you can look back as a slide archive. Think exactly on the solution and problem you are solving. You need to understand the jobs to be done to really think through the pains and gains. So if you're stuck, think of the functional, emotional, and social benefits. So in our last video for part three, we're going to think about how do we build the value proposition statement and what do all of this mean for your minimum viable product? So I want to open up with some starting points, some categories, if you will. But as you see here in the red circle, there are three starting points that are a no-go. Can you think to yourself why crafting a value proposition around being faster, cheaper, or generally better are not great places to start. I'll give you a moment to think on that. Well, it's because you're a young and new startup with most likely limited resources such as people and capital. So you really have nothing to lose but to pick a big problem to fight. It's just as hard to solve a big, a small problem as it is a big problem as a young startup. But with big problems come game changing opportunities and big problems present big opportunities for a startup. So consider that you can afford to break the rules and push further than some of these, these points here. So really thinking on newness. Some value propositions are based on solely the novelty that they offer. This element really comes in handy for technology intensive products, but originally thinking that this is a new or innovative idea that no one's ever seen before are some great places to think of the value. Performance, thinking of just better resulting faster computers to support more sophisticated technology. Thinking back from Steve's example, performance could be an Intel doubling the speed of its chips every year. 
Thinking next point on customization, maybe this was quite popular. The modern consumer believes in self-expression, individuality, and products can be an extension of this as well, part of our personality. Being able to customize is a really popular thing in recent times. Uh, you can also think of the design. Mo most clothing labels may take this in higher rank, can be designer, thinking also on the next bullet on brand or status. The these are quite similar, but appeal to different customers really values differently here. Just as people will show loyalty to a brand, particularly because of a design, people will also show part loyalty because of a particular brand or status. Moving right along to risk reduction, these could be in terms of product cost reduction or other risks associated with purchasing a product or service, the more value a customer derives from it. Uh, a reduction of risk is usually with a purchase provides the peace of mind. Other points include convenience or usability. You can think of accessibility, providing consumers with a product that increases their convenience or characterized by the ease of use. It's a very strong value proposition around many companies that have built empires on this. One example is Apple, of course. iPod provided consumers with a convenient way to listen to music while pairing it with iTunes and the other i amenities. Uh, and lastly, on cost reduction, I do have a little asterisk on there. And the reason being is that it's sometimes very hard to prove that you actually are a cheaper solution. There's other components to the business model that might need to work that really might prove that you really are not actually the cheaper solution. So this is a really tough value to base yourself on. And why go there when there are other ways to express how meaningful your startup can be to customers to solve their problems or create significant gains for them. So take a moment to think of your startup and think of the problems and write some value propositions that could cater to some of these points here. After you do that, we'll now cover some a bit on the value minimum viable product and why it's important in your value proposition and customer discovery process. So now that you've written some value proposition statements, we are gonna go out and test those through customer discovery. Go out and interview people to see if they really care about what solution you're bringing to market. And so with many of you with what we've already developed or thought of, you are starting at a technical insight. You're a solution looking for a problem. But your goal is to get market insight, consumer insight. Insight is the ability to enable you to determine why customers believe in regards to some things. With this information, you're really being able to extract a lot of insight on purchasing and why customers buy certain things. Some of these key market insights could be really used to identify new revenue streams, developing specific campaign towards, towards your customers, measuring current performance. Market insight is what you'll get from speaking to customers and understanding the benefits that delight them. This is your aha moment that you had no idea on what the customer insight was before this process. So let's look at an example quickly on what this exactly means into context. So a technical insight as an example, let's use Tesla. They figured out how to make the battery for an electric vehicle lasts longer and charge faster. So performance, possibly even customization, thinking back on those starting points. This is pretty technical. That's the actual battery itself. However, a market insight can come from an example of Twitter. What they realized was that people were more likely to write personal blogs of 140 word characters than actually 140 words or sentences in total in a post. It was easy to send out a quick thought and that people were ready to solve a need on the human, human connection insight. So, Thinking on this technical versus market insight, you can also think Tesla well had a market insight as well. Do you know what Tesla's market insight really was? Well, it's because Tesla decided, knew that wealthier people wanted to be environmentally friendly. They wanted still to be able to drive electric cars, but at the time there was nothing that catered to their need for brand or status. It just didn't look cool enough for that customer archetype. So what they also did was design the car, deliver this value of a more luxurious, futuristic looking car. So again, 
thinking back on archetypes will really help you pull insight necessary needed through the customer discovery process. So as a quick joke, don't be a solution looking for a problem. You want to make sure that you've already thought this through before you go out and do some interviews. So let's finish up on the MVP. We know what the stands for, the minimum viable product. And does, in the most basic way, what product or service are you building in your first instance to be delivered to the early evangelists? Anyone remember what early evangelists are? Can we think of what early evangelists are right now? Well, it's those first early adopters, the people who are ready to buy your product yesterday, the ones crazy enough to be the first customers in, doesn't even work fully, all the features are there, but that's how you can know to push forward on testing the solution. So as Steve Blank says, to define your minimum viable product, you'll want to first think of a minimum feature set. And this is needed to learn from your early customers to avoid building products that nobody wants. After you've engaged in customer discovery, then, and you've really figured out the problem, then you can build a low fidelity, low feature MVP for customer feedback. And we'll go over this in the agile development discussion, but thinking of the iterations and the now, next, and later to build your product will test your understanding of the problem. Later on, much later in the customer development and, cu and company building execution, you'll most likely build a high fidelity or high feature MVP that really tests your understanding. So thinking on some famous MVP examples, I have some photos archived here. Startups fail because they do a big bang delivery. They think that they need the full feature set on day one to please customers. But that's not true. You want to think iteratively and incrementally with thinking. Use the, use the low fidelity MVP to learn from your customers. Looking at this diagram of how the car was create, developed, you cannot give number two to a customer to test out. They would be very unhappy with that sort of solution. This will get you nowhere. So I like to think that the car was built in mind with this oversimplified metaphor for product development. Well, initially, initially the concept was a skateboard and the customer feedback came back, well, this wasn't sturdy enough. I really enjoyed the wind through my hair, but I need more stability. Then comes the scooter with the essence of a pull, thinking, okay, this is a little better, but I still don't have enough speed. Crafting further, then comes the bike and the motorcycle, until you finally reach what the development comes to with a happy face of a convertible. And why I like this example is that also you could think if you did customer discovery properly, the car ends up with an open body on top rather than a closed hood and it shows that the customer here really may have enjoyed the wind through their hair and so that's how the car got to the point later to be the convertible keeping the essence of agile development so even though customers buy swiss berries titanium hardware polyurethane wheels and hollow trucks what they really want to do is just go out to the skate park and enjoy time with their friends and some free exercise so do not forget to think iteratively through the process and being able to pivot along the way in your technology development. Know the difference between technical insight and market insight. So to wrap up this discussion, think of the common mistakes you may be making. Do not use vague or marketing terms such as mission statements, as value propositions. It's not a list of features. Always think what's the benefit of this feature. Do not forget to quantify. Quantifying is an, is, do not forget to quantify. You need to be able to know whether you're really making a difference or if the metric is really impactable. Don't confuse nice to haves with must haves. Really think of the frequency and intensity that you're hearing certain things and be able to discern when you realize that not enough customers are caring and it's time to pivot and use, do a different hypothesis. The need to learn from customer interviews comes from market insights as well as the social and emotional jobs. Remember, you're focusing in on learning about the problem. Your customers don't care about your idea or your technology. So your final tip, 
is don't forget the customer, bring it back to them on the business model canvas. As you write your value proposition statements, consider numerically linking them to which customer really cares about what you're talking about. So this concludes our value proposition discussion. Be sure to update your business model canvas and watch up next our lecture discussion on customer segments.